be analysing the convergence of the twain by Thomas Hardy. Um, we're going to learn about how to analyse poetry in depth and learn how to write an analytical essay on poetry and learn how to work out what a difficult poem means. Um, the Convergence of the Twain was written by Thomas Hardy in response to the Titanic disaster. It, the poem expressed the pessimism of the age, that is, the kind of um, way of looking at the world which was quite negative. If you're pessimistic, you look on the bad side of things. And this is very much what this poem does. It doesn't see the positives in the Titanic disaster. It really focuses on the negatives. It is deliberately complex and thought-provoking and it's full of difficult language. The Convergence of the Twain itself is quite a difficult title to get your head around. Um, it literally means the coming together of the two. Convergence means coming together. It's from a Latin or coincidence as well actually and twain is two and this is an old-fashioned word for two and it's what we call archaic lexis old-fashioned lexis the um, subheading is lines on the loss of the titanic and it was written um, very shortly after the titanic sank um, Hardy was living in England at the time in Dorset and was a keen reader of the newspapers and keen follower of events. Um, a key idea in this poem is um, the whole thought of what causes things in life. Is it pure chance or is it God or a supernatural force? Is it face, fate or some force that has mapped out everything for us? And we need to think about this before we read the poem. What do you think is the thing that causes most of the kind of key events in life? Is it just fate, luck, God? Um, have your own thoughts and write them down in your book. Put the title, um, What Do You Think Causes Things in Life? And write a sentence or two about this. Hardy believed that the what he called the imminent will um, caused things in life. He did not believe in God um, at a time when most people did. He believed the universe was ruled by the imminent will and imminent means in everything. So if something's imminent, not imminent with an I, but imminent, um, it is uh, in everything. And will is the force or fate. So the imminent will was like a fate in that it drives forward all actions but it is mindless it doesn't care what happens and this is very much his thoughts on this he feels that the universe was ruled by a kind of mindless force this is the first verse we're going to go through it in a solitude of the sea deep from human vanity and the pride of life that planned her stilly couches she so the first line is in the solitude, and this is in the loneliness or emptiness of the sea, deep from human vanity or far away from the vain hopes of human beings. And vanity means excessive pride or admiration in your own appearance. Um, so far away from the pride of, you know, taking pride in your appearance and the things you have. And the pride of life that planned her, the pride of life is the great things in life or the imag human imagination or um, the proudness that was part of the creation of the Titanic. Remember, very proud people created the Titanic, didn't they? Bruce Ismay, the maker of it, had plans to make the greatest ship in the world and um, he is part of the pride of life, as were all the other people that were part of the making of the Titanic um, planned her stilly couches she I love this word stilly um, Hardy plays around with language and it just means very still or not moving and you get a kind of sense of the uh, the ship being very still but slightly moving or wobbling at the bottom of the ocean and again couches she couches meaning um, lies sitting down like on a, as on a couch she so deep at the bottom of the ocean in a very still way 
the Titanic is lying far away from all of the kind of vanity and the pride that planned her. Steel chambers, late the pyres of a salamandrin fires, cold currents thrid and turn to rhythmic tidal lyres. Um, this is a wonderful verse, but it's quite difficult. Um, you need to read it a few times to really enjoy it. Steel chambers are the rooms of the Titanic. The steel rooms, late the pyres of her salamandrine fires. Um, late meaning um, they've gone out. If, um, if you say the late person, as in they're dead, um, the late Mr. Smith, um, if he's died. So um, the pyres are mounds of things that belong to dead people that are burnt at a funeral often in certain societies and this used to be the case in England um, so the late the pyres, the pyres, the, the, the burning of people's things has gone out of a salamandrine fires um, salamandrine means lizard-like fires so basically all those lines mean is um, that the fires of her engines have gone out cold currents thrid um, this, so the the cold currents of the sea weave in and out of the engine rooms of the Titanic and then this beautiful line and turn to rhythmic tidal lyres so he imagines all the currents of the ocean weaving in and out of um, the uh, w w engines in the Titanic and create a um, music. A uh, lyre is a musical instrument and it's tidal because it's dependent on the tide. So what we have here in the second verse is a picture of the fires of the Titanic have gone out as it's lying at the bottom of the ocean and these cold currents are weaving in and out of the engine rooms um, and are creating this kind of strange kind of music. Um, what I'd like you to do is stop the tape after each verse and write down in your books an explanation of these verses after you've listened to me and what I've said um, and use quotation and, and try and get your own thoughts down because you won't absorb it all in one go. There's a lot to think about here. Verse 3 Over the mirrors meant to glass the opulent the sea worm crawls, grotesque, slimed, dumb, indifferent. Um, so over the mirrors meant to glass or reflect back the opulent, the rich people who looked into them. So he's imagining the mirrors of the very rich people are lying at the bottom of the ocean um, and a sea worm, some disgusting, horrible sea worm-like creatures crawling over the mirrors that the um, opulent, the rich people used to look into and the sea worm is grotesque, is ugly, slimed, is um, slimy, dumb, doesn't speak and indifferent, doesn't care at all and it's a beautiful, it's an amazing image isn't it, um, it's what Hardy is using what we call um, opposites or antithesis here to emphasize the horror of the um, ship being at the bottom of the ocean. Um, you should write down your explanation of the verse though and what you feel about it and any questions it provokes in you. Jewels in joy designed to ravish the sensuous mind lie lightless, all their sparkles bleared and black and blind. Um, in this verse, you'll notice a lot of examples of what we call alliteration, that is, a repeated letter sounds, and that happens in the first line, jewels in joy, so the J sound is repeated, emphasizes the jewels and the joy, doesn't it, and brings out the sense of these jewels being amazing. What I'd like you to do is circle them in your notes or make a note of them, and um, think about the effect the word has. 
So these jewels and joy were designed to ravish or seize or carry off a sensuous mind, an attractive mind. So these jewels that were there to really um, entice and um, seize and, and really think about uh, people um, are now lightless, they lie lightless, more alliteration, the repeated hell sound, all their sparkles bleared and black and blind. I love this alliteration here, bleared and black and blind. So all the jewels have lost their sparkle, they're bleary, they're, they can't be seen properly, they're black, um, all of their beautiful colours are hidden by the slimy kind of murk that's down there and they're blind, no one can see them at all. Um, no, one, no one can see these beautiful jewels that are once so opulent and beautiful on the Titanic. Write your own explanation of this verse and the effect it has on you and any questions you think it m might provoke in your mind and any any techniques you notice in it, you know, um, if you if there's an image that really grips you, write that down. Dim moon-eyed fishes near gaze at the gilded gear and query, what does this vain gloriousness down here? Um, this is a wonderful image of just these fishes swimming by the Titanic and they're moon-eyed because they're de deep down in the bottom of the ocean and they don't have much access to light and they gaze at the gilded gear, um, gilded as in covered in gold and gear things. So they gild, they look at all of the kind of beautiful things that are in the first class compartments and they ask this question, what is this vaingloriousness here? Um, wh why are, what is this stuff doing here basically is a basic question and also um, you know it's vainglorious this stuff because it just seems to be too full of itself, too um, full of pride, too proud. Um, and they're asking this question because the fish is fine. It's just swimming around, having a nice life at the bottom of the ocean. And they're not affected by the sorts of desires that human beings can have. They don't suffer, perhaps in the way that we do, from these awful sort of vanities. Um, verse 6 Well, while was fashioning this creature of cleaving wing the imminent will that stirs and urges everything so in this, first, this verse is just part of a, a, a whole sentence that runs on to the next verse but it's worth just stopping here so while was fashioning fashioning is making so while this creature of cleaving wing was being made. The creature of cleaving wing is the Titanic and it's called cleaving, uh, it, it's a creature, it's obviously like a huge thing, um, uh, a huge kind of monster. And calls it cleaving, well it's split, cleaving means split and wings, so it's, I think he has this image of the Titanic being like two sort of huge wings that have been joined together, um, possibly. Um, you can decide what you think of that image. I think it's a sort of image of um, the Titanic being like this monstrous split bird. Um, that's it for me. Um, personally, I do find the image a bit mysterious. Um, there is kind of a sense of alliteration and, and rhythm in that line. It makes you think about it. The imminent will that stirs and urges everything. Remember, we talked about this already. The imminent will is fate or this sort of mindless force in the universe um, which decides what's going to happen, um, is stirring and urging everything. And notice in the rhythm of the line, you get a sense of the bubbling under of something sinister going on. Prepared a sinister mate for her, so gaily great a shape of ice for the time fat and dissociate. So the imminent will, this is a run-on line, isn't it, is preparing a sinister mate. Think about the effect of the run-on line. It, it creates the suspense, doesn't it? You know, what is um, the imminent will bubbling under to make? Well, it's this sinister mate for her. It's a shape of ice. It's an iceberg. Um, so, and the he puts in 
parenthesis here um, that the Titanic is gaily great. Uh, um, in a, that time, gaily meant um, very happy, happily great. So, um, and the iceberg is fat and dissociate. A fat, as in huge, and dissociated, not connected with anything at all. You know, nothing to do with the kind of human making of this ship or anything to do with humanity at all. And as the smart ship grew in stature, grace and hue, in shadowy, silent distance, grew the iceberg too. So as the ship grows in stature or size and grace in the kind of beauty of its design and hue, colour, um, it was painted beautifully, remember, in shadowy, silent distance grew the iceberg too. Notice the amazing impact of the rhythm of a line when you read it out aloud, the shadowy, silent distance grew the iceberg too and you can feel in the rhythm the iceberg growing can't you shadowy and glimmering and flickering and being there in the background waiting in uh, in the wings as it were so it's growing in the silent distance a long way from everything Alien they seemed to be. No mortal eye could see the intimate welding of their later history. So they seemed to be alien or foreign to each other, the iceberg and the Titanic. No mortal eye, no human eye could see the intimate or um, very close welding. Welding is mel melting together or binding together of their later history. So no one could see that they would be bound together um, as sort of almost one thing later on in their history in in the um, existence of their their existence 10 or sign that they were bent by paths coincident and being anon twin halves of one august event or sign that they were bent um, or sign or um, have any awareness that there was a, a sign or have any kind of sense that they were bent, um, destined or set on a path by paths coincident by, uh, by similar journeys or journeys that coincided with each other on being a non, being at once twin halves of one august event being two halves of a whole August meaning serious, very serious or solemn event, not meaning the month, because obviously the Titanic sank in April 2012, um, so don't get that wrong. Um, so no one could have any idea that these two things were two halves of a whole event, um, and that they were going... Going, by some sort of ghastly coincidence they were going to come together and, and smack together like this till the spinner of the years said now and each one hears and consummation comes and jars two hemispheres um, fantastic ending to this poem till the spinner of the years that's the imminent will or fate person in charge of time often people in old-fashioned country um the, the uh, old con country uh, conventions hardly lived in the country in dorset and people would talk about time being the spinner of years this image of um time being almost a lady at a spinning wheel and this lady says now and each one hears and consummation comes the final act comes, it's almost sometimes referred to as sexual intercourse, um, some sort of final point where all things are resolved, um, and it's when things are joined together, smack together. Um, that's why it's often talked about as sexual intercourse, because you have this idea of consummation, things really coming together, and jars or breaks put out of kilter, or puts out of alignment, two hemispheres, two worlds. So till the imminent will said now now these two things the ship and the iceberg are going to come together and um, be part of one event and they're going to and as a result of them coming together 
as one. They break two worlds. They destroy two worlds. Uh, it's a very good ending. Um, uh, jars two hemispheres. So there's a sense of two worlds being broken in apart. Obviously, we need to think about this. Well, the first world is the world of the Titanic, isn't it? Being broken down, completely destroyed. But there's another world, isn't it? The world of um, nature being put out of alignment with the world of man, perhaps. Or even perhaps the wider world. Um, the ti Many people felt the Titanic led to... Um, uh, disasters. So what you've got to do now is, um, using your notes, answer this question. How effective is the convergence of the twain as a poem? And what you're going to do is have an introduction, talk about the Titanic, perhaps talk about Thomas Hardy, um, and then an explanation of the poem, pointing out its powerful use of poetic language, its use of imagery, its first structure and rhyme scheme, its exploration of the ideas and themes connected with the Titanic. And the poem is full of poetic language, which is very suggestive. It really makes you think about the Titanic and feel things and see things. And you need to really, in your essay, answer this question, what poetic language makes you feel in a particular way about the Titanic and why? What poetic language makes you think about the Titanic and why? And what poetic language makes you see things and why does it do this and how does it do this, crucially? So you need to get some notes together in answer to these questions so that you can put them together in a paragraph of writing looking at the poetic language in the, in the piece. Um, feelings. I've written out some to give you an idea of how to approach this essay. This poem creates a very creepy and sinister atmosphere through its use of poetic language to describe the way the Titanic is lying at the bottom of the sea. This is particularly the case when Hardy uses the phrase, stilly couches she. He uses the word stilly to describe how still or quiet the Titanic is at the bottom of the ocean. This, for me, is quite creepy to think about. That amazing ship, once so full of life, completely still at the bottom of the ocean, full of dead people floating in silence. And then think, what other creepy uses of poetic language are there in this poem? Quite a few, actually. There are times when Hardy makes you feel angry about the people on the Titanic, some of them. He suggests they were full of vanity and vaingloriousness. It made me think of the selfish first-class passengers on the ship who had so much money and only thought of themselves. I thought it was particularly effective when he describes the fishes wondering what vaingloriousness is down there. This is almost funny because and you could fill that sentence in, couldn't you? Now describe some of the other parts of the poem that provoke feelings.